What does it mean to be a neighbor? You see a need and you meet it. You know the price and you pay it. And you don't talk yourself out of it. Let me repeat that. You see a need and you meet it. You know the price and you pay it. And you do not talk yourself out of it. Today, if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at a new sermon series called For All Kinds. And we're looking at a few verses in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3 is an incredible chapter. Colossians chapter 3. We're going to look at what are the characteristics of a follower of Jesus. What does it look like? Not, Not for you to tell me that you're a follower of Jesus. But what does it look like to live out what it means to be a follower of Jesus? There's some characteristics in verse 12, 13, and 14. And here's my challenge to you as a challenge to me as well that we would memorize these three verses. So that's, that's your homework over the, over the summer, okay? You have all summer to memorize these three verses. Colossians chapter 3. For all kinds. What, is it, what does it look like to have healthy relationships with, with people not like you. Even people like you is difficult enough, right? I mean, even, I think of my siblings. We have a lot in common, but boy, it's sometimes it's still really difficult to get along. People not like you. For all kinds of people, the Bible tells us how we're to act, how we're to behave. What are some of the things and characteristics that it looks like, that it looks like to follow Jesus? Colossians Three is written by Paul. He's sitting in prison in around 62 AD, and he's writing to the church at Colossae. So context is everything. He's sitting in prison. He's writing Colossians chapter 3. This is a Roman world, right? Keep in mind, in the Roman world at this time, there are more slaves then there are Roman citizens. This is a slavery-driven culture. No one in the Greek, Greek world or the Roman world had intrinsic value. They did not believe that you had value. Your life was based on circumstance, uh, luck. It's, if something bad happened in your life, well, the gods, you did something to earn that. Right? This, is, this is the world in which, which Paul is writing. This is the early church days. The church is getting started. And what are the early followers of Jesus known for? We're going to learn about that over the next next few weeks. This is the culture in which Jesus showed up. Colossians chapter 3. We're going to hear words. There's some powerful verbs in these few verses. Words like clothe yourselves. Paul uses this illustration throughout the book of Colossians. Put on. It's the same illustration he uses when he talks about put on the full armor of God. If you've ever studied that passage of putting on the helmet and the breastplate, he uses the same illustration in Colossians 3. Put on. You want to look really attractive? There's a few characteristics to wear. More than the clothes that you put on. You want to look really, really good. These are the characteristics, Paul says, to wear. Clothe yourselves. Put on. Other verbs in this passage, bear, bind, put on. And it ends with forgive. Colossians 3. Anytime you hear this word, it causes you to ask yourself the question, what is it there for? Colossians 3, 12. Put on then, some translation says, therefore, you ask yourself the question when you see the word therefore, what is it therefore, right? And so we ask ourselves, why is this, what he's about to write, why is it there? We go back to verse 1. Verse 1 of Colossians 3 says, therefore. So he keeps building on his argument. This is what he's saying. This is what it means to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. This is, Paul is saying, this is what it means, at Boulder Mountain we call it a a disciple of Jesus. This is what it means to be all in follower of Jesus. Therefore, Paul says in verse 1, if you've been raised with Christ, if you've placed your faith and trust in Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. 
this is Paul saying to all of us here today, through the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to not, to not be focused on this world, but to be focused on things, things above. Verse 12. Put on then, clothe yourselves, right? Dress as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. You are chosen as a follower of Jesus. You were, you were picked by God to be a follower. You are loved. This morning, you are loved by God. Holy and beloved. So now what do we put on? First, first word here we're going to look at today, compassion. Compassionate hearts, kindness. Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. That is the passage I'm asking you to memorize over the next few weeks. Compassion. What does it mean to have compassion? It's not just sympathy. Aren't you so glad Jesus didn't just have sympathy for us? It's empathy. Empathy is active. Sympathy is passive. Sympathy is a feeling. Empathy is I am moving towards you. I am now going to do something because of what I see. In Matthew, it says, Matthew writes, and Jesus saw the crowds and he had compassion. What always precedes compassion in the New Testament is sight. He saw and he had compassion. It's really difficult to have compassion if all you see is yourself. If your head is so low in our family, we called it navel gazing. That was before cell phones. Now you could, there's a lot of things you could call it. But my head is so focused on, on my phone, on me and what I need. I don't, I'm not seeing any needs out there. And as a result, I have no compassion for anyone. Because all I see is myself. And Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He saw them. For they were like sheep without a shepherd. You think of all the things Jesus saw in his three years of ministry that the gospel writers noticed. In the middle of a really busy room, a loud room, where the voices are echoing throughout the temple. And he's in the middle of all the Pharisees and the religious leaders. While that's going on, do you know what he saw across the room? A widow drop one coin all she had into the box. He saw it. He saw it. That was the most important thing in the room to him, was what this widow did. Not, not the power of the men in the room. Jesus shows up and he flips everything upside down. You see, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the culture in which Jesus entered, it was this. It was a culture that said, Cleanliness is next to godliness. It was a culture that said, love your people. In fact, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, this is, this is what was taught to the Jewish people. You shall not take vengeance or bear or a grudge against any of your people. Leviticus 19, 18. Your people. You ever heard that's not my people? Those aren't my people. Leviticus 19. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Does that sound familiar? I am the Lord. To love another Jew was to be a good Jew. They interpreted that as, oh, I'm to my people. I'm to love my people. I'm to forgive my people. I'm going to treat my people the way I want to be treated. Okay, that, that's my neighbor. Throughout the Old Testament, that was their neighbor. And what does Jesus do? He, he turns everything upside down, doesn't he? The Samaritan woman, when she's alone collecting water, he sees her. He makes a beeline for her, meets her there at the well. Nobody else saw her. Anybody in the room today feel like you went throughout the week and nobody saw me, nobody noticed me? I'm invisible to the world. My encouragement to you is Jesus sees you. He sees you. And he doesn't just have sympathy for what you're going through. He has empathy 
He moves towards you. Jesus says, I see you, and I have compassion on you. He's walking down the road, and he's, his head isn't so low that he doesn't see the guy sitting in the tree. He sees the guy in the tree, Zacchaeus. He's a wee little man. <laughs> a wee little man was he. Why is he in the tree? Because he wanted to see Jesus. Listen. Jesus sees us before we see him. And if you haven't seen Jesus, he's seen you. And he is drawing you in. He says, I see you. I love you. I care about you. I've come to, I've come to save you. The sick people, the passage Isaac read earlier today. He knew. He knew who reached out and touched him. He asked the question, who was it? He saw her. The centurion servant and his disciples, not a centurion, not the enemy, not the Romans. You can't associate with them. Listen, Jesus went out of, out of his way to value the people that society said had no value. And in the Roman and Greco Roman culture and the world, if you were down on your luck, it was your own fault. If things had happened in your life, well, so be it. That's what you get. That's what you deserve. Or the Jews would say, well, you did something bad in your previous life or your parents did something bad. That's why you're struggling with life because your mom or your dad or previous generations, you're now paying for the crimes of your, of your parents. And Jesus shows up and he says, no, I'm not here to pay you back. I'm here to win you back. If anyone is feeling like in life, life's been really hard in your life, Jesus says, I'm not here to pay you back for any of us. His desire and his goal is to win us back. The greatest acts begin first with an observation. What do you see and who do you see throughout your week? Is there enough margin in your life to stop and notice the person? And ask yourself the question, where, God, show me the needs in my life today. Place people in my path today and give me, help me leave a little bit early so that I can have some margin to meet a need that shows up in my life today. Jesus saw before he did. And oftentimes he looked before he loved. Jesus looked and he had compassion. What is compassion? It's doing for someone that they could never do back to you. You want a definition, a working definition of what is compassion? Is doing, doing something for someone that they could not do, not only for themselves, but for you. Listen, I think we would all sign up to be nice to somebody who's going to be nice back to us. Like that's, hey, I'll sign up for that deal, right? I'll give you a gift, you give me a gift. Hey, who? That's easy. But Jesus had compassion on people who couldn't, who couldn't repay him. When was the last time? This is just a question between you and God. When was the last time you did something for someone who could not repay you? And there was no expectation involved. Paul writes, this is what it looks like to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. These are the clothes we put on as we go throughout our week. In the Roman world, when they did not want a child... When they did not want a baby, they would expose that child at the edge of the forest. And they would place that baby at the edge of the forest. They would expose the child. And they removed all responsibility from themselves. And that child was exposed to the elements. And if an animal came and devoured the, the child, it was what the gods do as they so, so please. And you know who showed up at the edge of the forest? Early followers of Jesus. They were the ones who were rescuing the babies until that was overruled by Constantine a couple hundred years later. It was the Christians. They were known not by what they said, but by what they did. These Christians are crazy people, historians said. They're a generous group of people. They give with no limit. Extravagant generosity. What would it look like for Boulder Mountain? to be an extravagant church, to say, oh, I've never been there, 
But I've heard they're a pretty generous group of people. I've heard, I've heard of their compassion. Jesus gave value to people the culture had said has no value. I think of Acts chapter 6 when the early leaders of the church had to be pried away from serving tables and serving widows and bringing food to the tables. Now, why was that so difficult to pull them away from that? Because they had just spent three years. They saw Jesus. And they knew that when you have a clean heart, it leads to dirty hands. Now, I know spiritually we're to have clean hands and a clean heart, but how does that play out? Throughout our week, we're to have compassion, to have empathy. You know what that looks like? It means to get dirty, right? When Jesus washed disciples' feet, do you think his hands were clean? His hands were dirty. What does it look like for you and I to have compassion to the point where my hands are dirty? If you've ever said, oh, the more I get involved in this, the messier it gets. Yeah, Jesus too. Jesus can relate. I'm a pretty messy person. When he gets involved in my life, it, it gets messy. I want to talk for a few moments about a, a story that he told. Jesus tells a story in Luke chapter 10. It's going to answer a couple of questions. It's a, it's a parable. A parable is a heavenly story with earthly principles. Luke chapter 10. Many of you, if you're a Jesus follower or not, you've probably heard this phrase. You've probably been to a hospital that's named after this story, the Good Samaritan. And you might be somewhat familiar with it. Let me sum it up for you. As Jesus is teaching, most of the people are probably sitting down. One man stands up, and he happens to be a lawyer. And he asks Jesus a question. Verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, right? So we, we hear of his motive here. There's a, there's a motive. When Jesus was asked questions, there were always ulterior motives. And he says, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, Jesus is brilliant. He always a answers a question with a question, right? Dads, it's Father's Day. Do that with your kids when they ask you a question. Ask them a question back. What is written in the law? How do you read it? So Jesus said, hey, you should know. Why are you asking me? What do you think it says? Now, he had been in the crowds a few chapters before when Jesus added something. All right, hold on. And the lawyer says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. So everybody there knew the first part of that. They, every boy, every girl, every Jewish child grew up. They memorized that. Every Jewish person in the culture, they knew this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. They, this, was in, this was a part of who they were. This was written in their homes. It was, it was above their doorpost. I mean, this was, this was what it meant to be a Jew. Jesus shows up. So for hundreds of years, Jesus shows up, and he breaks tradition. He adds to it. He adds to it. And he says... And, this is really important, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so this teacher heard him say that a few chapters before. And so he's like, oh, I heard you teaching the other day. And so he's feeling pretty confident. And so he answers the, the question, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus is like, hey, well done. You probably gave him a wink. Hey, good job. You answered this correctly. Do this and you will live. But he has to justify himself. The lawyer does. He says to Jesus, now who's my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Now a good Jew, not get their hands dirty with anybody who's not a Jew. In fact, there were some rabbis who would teach that to help a Jewish woman in labor, you, you would not be allowed to do that. Number one, you would be dirty and unclean because you'd be touching a Gentile woman. But more than that, you would be helping bring a Gentile into the world. This is what a rabbi, some of the rabbis would teach. That you are not allowed to associate and, and get your hands dirty with other kinds of people, with other groups of people. 
And so he says, well, who's my neighbor? So he's trying to trap Jesus. And Jesus replies, let me tell you a story. He's like, just answer the question. We don't need to, we don't need to hear a story here. But Jesus, great storyteller. In fact, this story has had ripple effect for thousands of years, this story right here. And he says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, having him left half dead. Now, I don't know if there's three dads going to come by here, but there's a good chance there's three fathers that are going to show up into this story. Happy Father's Day. One of the fathers gets it right. And so there's a guy, he's, he's beaten, he's stripped. And he's barely alive, laying in the ditch. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Unclean, right? This is what they were taught for thousands of years. I'm going to cross the street, and I'm going to make all these excuses why he's laying in the ditch. Well, he, he shouldn't have been traveling on the road by himself, and it's his own fault. And he made a bunch of poor choices in his life, and that's why he's laying in the ditch. So, not my problem. Justified. Lack of compassion often is associated with an excuse. At least one, maybe, maybe more. And I've been guilty of it. I think about times in my life where I didn't help. And I, I justify it, right? We come up with reasons and we come up with excuses. That's the first one. A Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. Another religious leader passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan. And I know there's some history, you might know of the history, but let me just emphasize it. Institutional racism. This is institutional racism. A Samaritan was worse than a Gentile. I'll just describe to you what, I just described to you what their views on Gentiles were. This was a Samaritan. They were called dogs, right? And so he's telling the story, and you could hear a pin drop as he's telling the story. But a Samaritan passed by. And as he journeyed, he came to where he was, and he saw him, and he had compassion. What did he do? The priest, what did the priest do? The first thing, look at the text. He saw him. He saw him. And the Levite shows up, and the Levite, he saw him. And the Samaritan, this word, pay attention to words that show up often in the passage. He saw him. And he had compassion. Oh, my friends, what would it mean if, if a follower of Jesus was known as when we saw needs, we had compassion. And our heart broke. And it moved us to action. He went to him and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. You know what he did? He touched him. He touched him. His hands got bloody. His hands got dirty. His wallet got empty. He put him on the donkey, and you know, that meant he walked while the Jew rode on the donkey, and he walked. Then he went to the holiday, and he says, whatever, how, he can stay here as long as he wants. Put it on my bill. It cost him something. When you see a need and you have compassion, it's going to cost you something. He was not going to be able to pay him back. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and whatever you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Now, he asked the question at the end of the story, which one of these three, which one of these three was his neighbor? A lawyer couldn't even say the word Samaritan. You see that? couldn't even say the word. He said, the one who had mercy on him. The one who had mercy on him. And I think there was a grumblings and mumblings in the crowd. Surely he can't. What? Did you hear? Samaritan? Which one of these things do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, and Jesus says to us today, Go and do likewise. If you're taking notes, go and do likewise. You see a need, you meet it. You, you have to see it. 
And some of us, that means we have to go to some places where there are needs. We have to get out of our really cozy, clean environments where some of us stay all week long because everybody looks good and, and there, I don't see any needs. Well, then maybe we need to go to some places. There's a lot of needs in our community. If we have an hour a week, is there anywhere we could go where there are some significant needs and we can see these needs and then we can be moved to have compassion? We can meet some needs. We can have some conversation with the Holy Spirit on, on this. What does it look like? To have some needs. Who's my neighbor? Jesus says, no longer is a neighbor your people, as the Old Testament taught. No longer is neighbor my people, my tribe, the people I hang out with, the people right next door to me. That's Jesus said, he flips it upside down. He says, this is no longer your neighbor. A neighbor is not, is not limited by a location. A, labor, a, a neighbor is everybody in every nation, in every generation. That is a neighbor. And what does it mean to be a neighbor? He saw a need and met it. Men in the room were to be problem solvers, not creating problems. The church is better when we solve problems. Our jobs, our work environments are better than we, when we solve problems. Our community, Mesa, Northeast Mesa, our HOA, our work, our families are better when we solve problems and we're not problem creators, when we solve problems. May we be, as a church, known as a church that solve problems. What does it mean to be a neighbor? You see a need and you meet it. You know the price and you pay it. And you don't talk yourself out of it. Let me repeat that. You see a need and you meet it. You know the price and you pay it. And you do not talk yourself out of it. I'm really good at talking myself out of being compassionate. I don't know if anybody else can relate. I can come up with a hundred reasons. The Samaritan came with everything necessary. The Samaritan came right to the afflicted man. The Samaritan gave tender care. The Samaritan provided for future needs. Now, a parable. You've got to ask yourself the question, who am I in this parable? All right, I'm not the good Samaritan. I know we always like to put ourselves in the hero of the story. Nope. Can I be the Levite and can I be the priest? Yes. But let me go a little bit farther. I'm the one alongside the road, beaten and half naked. Cannot save myself. That's me. And biblically speaking, that's you too. Cannot save ourselves. Who is Jesus in the story? Jesus is the good Samaritan. Jesus shows up and he binds our wounds. He, he sees us and he stoops down and he does what is necessary. He binds our wounds. He heals our wounds. He doesn't just pay the price for what we need in the moment, but he gives us an inheritance for eternity. And he adopts us into his family. And what did the robber do? Nothing. Or not the robber. What did the victim along the road do to receive it? He just received it. He didn't, he didn't, he just received it. He was picked up. He was carried. He was cared for. He had compassion. That's what Jesus did. Jesus shows up in your life. You're broken and beaten. You feel like this world has kept you down and you're laying in the ditch and the trying to figure life out. And who's going to help me? And does anybody see me? And Jesus says, oh, I, I see you. I desire to have a relationship with you. I care about you. And if you've never placed your faith and trust in the good Samaritan, in fact, let me, let me redefine it. Jesus is not just good, he's great. Jesus is the great Samaritan that every one of us need. 
He, he meets needs that we don't, we're not even aware that we have. He shows up. And he shows up to the broken and the battered and the bruised. He shows up to those least deserving. He shows up to those he, not the most powerful, not the wealthy. He comes, comes for the sick. He leaves the 99 for the one. And I am so encouraged today that he sees me and he sees you. Jesus says, I see you. I see you. I don't just have sympathy for you. I have empathy and I have compassion. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? We give to others what has been done to us. We have been shown mercy. We have been shown grace. We have been healed. And we're to do the same with, with others. For all kinds of people. The people you get along with and the people you don't get along with. The people really difficult to love. The people who might be toxic, difficult, messy. Yeah. You know what? Because that's me sometimes. I can be difficult to love. Shocking, I know. Biblically speaking, so can you. And Jesus gives us grace. Grace is the most beautiful thing in the world. It's unconditional love when it meets in perfection. You and I bring one of those two, the imperfection, and Jesus brings the unconditional love, and that's grace. That's grace. Who do you, who needs compassion in your life? This week? Who is God calling you to move toward, to not cross the street, to move toward Him? To, it's going to cost you something. See, Jesus saw the need and He met it. Jesus knew the price and He paid it. And he didn't talk Himself out of it. He moved towards you, He saw you, and He moved towards you. He had compassion on you. He had compassion, and he has compassion presently, today. He has compassion on you. He sees you. That's ah, so encouraging. In a world where we all wonder, does anybody notice me? Does anybody see me? Does anybody care? She says, I see you. I see you. Would you pray with me? Father, I, I ask as we reflect and we consider and we discuss this passage. I pray for every person in the room that we would know that we are seen and loved by a Heavenly Father who created us, loved us, gave us worth and gave us value. In fact, there's nowhere we can go where He won't see us. God, thank You for Your compassion. Thank You for Your unfailing love. Would You Give us the eyes to see what you see this week. Even today, would you help us to see what you see? Help us to respond accordingly, to, to respond to the Holy Spirit saying, go, pay the price, meet the need, and don't run away. Father, would you help us to, to be a church known as generous compassion? Lavish compassion of, of meeting needs at great expense because that's what you did. I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd move freely in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this 
message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.